after uh, Monty. So. Sure. Yeah, that, that's right. Uh, I don't know if you have any other introductions to make for your grand rounds in general. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you all for joining us today. We have some uh, increased in person attendance, so it's great um, to get this back. Um, to see everybody. Okay. You carry on. Perfect, okay, thank you. Um, today we have the pleasure of Dr. Ari Amani, our very own here with us today. And just a quick couple announcements. Um, we wanna say we are back in person. We're gonna be having some breakfast. So please join us um, in person when you're on campus and please encourage all your fellows when you're on service as well to attend. Um, we're thrilled to see everybody back here today. Um, and I think Dr. Blass is gonna introduce Dr. Bonnie. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Kevin. And I really wanted to use this opportunity at the beginning of the year to really uh, thank our uh, uh, dynamic duo of uh, uh, Rohan Kara and uh, Catherine Clark for uh, managing our, our cardiovascular grand rounds. Um, and we have a really a wonderful year ahead of us. Just a few finer points on the issues raised. It certainly is my expectation for our uh, for those of uh, faculty who are running our inpatient services and the fellows uh, to be here in person and bring their teams. This is a wonderful opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, support um, this great series. Um, and uh, uh, certainly, uh, especially as we bring um, our esteemed um, faculty um, to, to give grand rounds as well as external guests, um, it is important to, to be present. Um, and so uh, I will be looking to, to really uh, see that um, increase in attendance is kind of a uh, getting back on the bicycle a little bit after uh, three years of a pandemic. And I do um, hope that uh, for those who need a little pick me up, the coffee and breakfast we'll be uh, providing will be uh, additional. I also give this opportunity to thank our uh, information technology services and folks for, for all their help um, uh, uh, in getting everything set up. So just a brief moment, uh, Aria asked me to keep it short uh, um, uh, because he has a lot to share with you. Um, just a moment. This is a this uh, is an opportunity for me to highlight two two issues. One is um, obviously Aria's uh, new distinguished professorship and its history. Um, and uh, and so just to remind all, um, Dr. Robert Berliner, in which the distinguished professorship that Aria received last year um, is named on, uh, was uh, really a a tremendous uh, um, physician investigator who really um, made critical um, uh, critical findings for our field. I don't know if you know his history, I would recommend you read, it, read up on it, but just briefly, um, he was a, a Yale graduate, a Columbia Medical School graduate, and then spent a fairly uh, a extensive career uh, initially at the NIH, where he, um, for all intents and purposes, defined uh, the molecular uh, underpinnings for uh, potassium and salt um, excretion in the kidney. Um, uh, and, uh, and in that role, um, initiated um, new administrative posts within the NIH, as well as uh, um, had many leadership roles himself. Um, he was recruited to, to Yale as its dean in 1973, and he served as dean for over 10 years uh, before retiring. Um, and his, uh, his impact on our field, particularly for those of us who are uh, uh, heart failure cardiologist or molecular biologist has been profound, and, and I encourage you to uh, learn about uh, that history. Um, we're very proud in our section um, through the uh, work of Dr. Barry Zarrett, uh, may he rest in peace, in having founded this uh, uh, um, professorship um, as well as endowed um, uh, this, uh, this distinguished um, uh, professorship in his name. And uh, many of us, including Dr. Martin Schwartz, myself, and now uh, Ari Amani, and uh, we'll hear from Rachel Lampert later in the year, uh, now have the Skinner Professorships in honor of Dr. Berliner. With, um, with that, let me just briefly introduce many, uh, someone who you know very well, Dr. Ari Amani, who has been here uh, quite some time at Yale. Um, to briefly summarize um, his, uh, you know, how he got to this point, he uh, grew up in uh, Iran and actually started his medical studies in, I believe I'm gonna say it wrong, Shiraz University in Iran, uh, which was unfortunately interrupted by uh, the challenges uh, in the late 1970s of, of, uh, of 
pursuing uh, medical studies in, in Iran during the, uh, the revolution there. Um, he uh, continued uh, uh, his medical studies in Germany, um, completing them in, I believe, uh, in 1990 or 91. Um, and um, from there, um, uh, emigrated to do some postdoctoral uh, work uh, here in uh, Fred Gorlick's lab uh, uh, at Yale. Uh, from there, he applied and actually um, uh, continued uh, as an internal medicine intern and resident and chief resident here at Yale before um, joining us for cardiovascular training. He's a graduate of the Yale Cardiovascular Program, um, which for which we're very proud, and then subsequently did postdoctoral work again with Richard Lifton, who, as you know, um, is the president of Rockefeller University and a, 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 um, a giant in genetics, where he defined and, and further focused his interest in cardiovascular genetics. He was a prominent member uh, clinically as well as, as an investigator on our faculty and became a professor, uh, I believe, in 2016, and now a distinguished professor. And was that brief introduction, Arya, take it away. Thank you very much for this very generous uh, introduction. It makes me actually cut some of my slides at the end. <laughs> but um, uh, so uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest uh, in the right. spirit of uh, Grand Rounds. I'm going to actually start with a case presentation. Uh, and then I'm going to get, uh, briefly touch on the role of metabolic syndrome as a growing risk factor for cardiovascular disease. And then we're going to provide some example of how we actually identify factors that unify the association of all these traits of metabolic syndrome uh, with the example of rare variants and com uh, common variants, or we call it GVAS variants, and the role of each of them in medicine. I think it's important even for clinicians to understand the difference between the two rare and common variants and their applications. So if I started the case, this is the real case that actually led to the like, identification of disease gene. 28 year old woman, can you believe it or not? actually came with a shoulder pain, past medical history, borderline hypertension, wasn't taking medication for it. She was morbidly obese, had asthma. Father had actually cabbage at the age 55, had, had uh, 30 and died at 55. And uh, at that time, we knew nine of uh, 12 uh, uncles and aunts, women and men all had coronary disease in their family. Actually, we were much more than uh, much, many more people actually be, this, they were recognized later. She was on no medication, 10 years of tobacco history. Exam was actually unremarkable, and EKG also, only sinus tachycardia. Uh, and then immediately she underwent a, a, a PCI of proximal LAD. Uh, somehow the clinicians were actually understood that she has a serious disease. And she was placed on the right medications. And the laboratory showed some abnormalities, such as glucose of 105, which is not diabetes uh, glucose, but is pre-diabetic triglyceride of 300. And these are findings that actually we call it the uh, metabolic syndrome. Now, uh, you, over the, the last uh, three, I don't know how this mouse is working on this, but it's not going on. Okay, over the last uh, four decades, actually, we had a decline of uh, cardiovascular mortality, largely due to development of drugs against cholesterol. But then most recently we see again a rise. And although we know, uh, doesn't change the slide for some reason. This one here. Okay, uh, maybe I click on it. Although uh, we know that not everybody responds to the treatment equally, some do and some get toxic effects. That is not going to explain why we actually see the rise, because these medications have been around for quite some time. But rather, the fact that actually we have other risk factors which we have ignored. If you look at the cholesterol levels between affected and unaffected individuals in our society, they quite overlap, except for little outliers that probably are patients with familiar hypercholesterolemia, et cetera, but also uh, noteworthy is that even if you have a patient with LDL receptor mutation, only 25% are diagnosed with coronary artery disease. And if they even miss one allele, so they are up haploid insufficient, only 35% have disease. So there is something else. It's not only one kind of factor that causes disease. And that I want to actually attract your attention 
to the effect of glucose and sugar and diabetes in our disease. Something had been ignored, actually suppressed by the industry over several decades, actually preventing publication on this area. And physicians have not been also innocent in this area. We know actually Angel Keys, who actually pioneered many of the nutrition studies. He actually believed that claim that men who have coronary heart disease are excessive sugar eaters is nowhere confirmed, but is disproved by many uh, studies. Interestingly, after his death, uh, they, they recovered a, a results of a, a study that he was running, his Minnesota coronary experiment, where he was actually comparing the saturated fat with unsaturated fat in the diet. And interestingly, even though unsaturated fat reduced the cholesterol significantly, they had more mortality. I'm not here to advocate for saturated fat, but what I'm trying to say is that one, but something else was kind of uh, ignored in their study, and that's the effect of other nutrients and being here glucose. Now, this led to kind of uh, pandemic of obesity in our country, and in the same dimension and same distribution, the disease that came with it, which is metabolic syndrome. So metabolic syndrome is a cluster of intermediate metabolic risk factor. One of them was cholesterol for diabetes and atherosclerosis. Remember, when you say syndrome, you mean that actually something underlying all the traits that it has, meaning linking all these traits. Now, if you look at five of them, which we actually use for de de defining metabolic syndrome, we, I, I kind of take randomly three of these. There are actually traits that you can hardly link to each other such as high blood pressure and HDL. Actually, controversial is to have high triglyceride and insulin resistance. Because patients with diabetes and insulin resistance, they secrete the triglyceride into the blood. Some of it is made de novo. They make it in the liver under stimulation of insulin. Insulin actually paradoxically is there to store energy, to make triglyceride, to keep the fat in your body. And then they have insulin resistance. So how, how, how this happens. So that's why actually people uh, denied, and some in the chronology actually believe that this, there is not such, such a syndrome. This is only an ascertainment bias, that your patients have all these independent of each other. And then we turn to genetics to disprove them. Why? Because if you have a mutation that is associated with each single of these traits, you're born with that mutation, right? It, this is germ line mutation, then you have established the causality. But the question is that what do we use? Rare variants or common variants in GWAS? Which one gonna give us an answer? So I turn you guys to the rare variants, something I actually dearly love because of some reason I'm gonna explain, but the way we did it in the old time was we, and even today, we find a family, multiple affected, and look at the regions that they share in the human genome, Normally, these are large regions, multiple genes, because it's a small family, recombination that doesn't happen a lot. And then we find a single mutation, let's say. Normally, actually, even we find multiple mutations in these five genes. If the family is larger, the region is a smaller, you can narrow on one gene or more if it is a smaller. And then you obviously, if you have multiple mutations, you have to have independent families to prove that this is causal. Now, the good thing about these rare variants is that the rarer the, the variant is, the higher is the effect size. And this has, really has benefit in the industry because these targets are the best targets for drug making, such as PCSK9, only found in two families in France to have a gain of function mutation. Now we are using it widely. Uh, CC fibrosis, ATTR, amyloidosis, all these are drug, great drug targets, identifying only in few families. The problem with this approach is that high phenocopy rate, which means that if you have an adult disease, which is common, let's say coronary artery disease affecting 7% of your population, it is possible that mutation in these two brothers is caused by different, you know, there are different mutations, different genes, because it's such a common disease. So it makes it difficult. And incomplete penetrance, meaning that this person who's unaffected, you cannot take him as, you know, non-carrier of the mutation. It may be a carrier. It makes it difficult in analysis. So what do we do? So we use an alternative, which is extreme phenotype. What does that mean? If you have a disease that occurs in child, uh, muscular dystrophy, it's unlikely that two members of the family have two different gene calls. I mean, it's very rare to happen. 
And that's what we do with coronary artery disease. We go very early onset and very severe disease. So let me bring you to one of our discoveries that we made about maybe 15 years ago. Uh, the scientists actually in Iran, they had discovered the very high risk population. They gathered three families they thought are unrelated and they um, sent it to us for genetic study. What was actually interesting among them was that they had a sarcopenic obesity. If you did not undress this individual, you would not see anything wrong with him. But, you know, luckily we did. And as we see, he has a low muscle mass and much more uh, adipose tissue. You're going to see that actually in, among South Asians, Iranians, in, uh, the Arabic countries, that this low muscle mass probably produces a problem for metabolism of glucose, causes insulin resistance, which is very prevalent in this region. So these guys you know, had it. Uh, they had coronary artery disease, they were hypertensive, some had diabetes and some insulin resistance, and they had elevated TG, all the traits that you can actually imagine uh, metabolic syndrome causes. And the mutation was a kinase, shown here. It's called DIRK1B, which is dual tyrosine kinase. It's highly expressed in the skeletal muscle and explains why actually these people have low muscle mass, because it's actually involved in myogenesis. And however, when we looked at these mutations, and this is the protein here in a lineal fashion, they didn't affect the catalytic subunit, which means that didn't affect the kinase part of it, they didn't involve the kinase. In fact, actually, there is a nuclear localization domain. This protein also goes to the nucleus, and even was not involved in that, but actually their homology domain, the mutation within there. And when you actually look at the 3D structure of this protein, there is not much of an interaction between this mutation and the kinase domain. And actually told us that this is a, a probably kinase independent effect of this mutation. We call these proteins, by the way, moonlighting proteins, which have not only a catalytic activity, but also non-catalytic activity. What was actually strange is that when we did fibrous scan, these patients have fatty liver disease. Now, this protein is not much expressed in the liver. So for that reason, actually about 77% have fatty liver disease. For that reason, actually, my talented postdoc, Neha Bhatt, went and looked at the mice. And mice had a little bit of an expression of this protein here shown in green. And then she put them on high-fat diet, made them having fatty liver disease. And lo and behold, this protein level went up. It could be just association. She then became interested to get NASH samples from the pattern of pathology. And patients, we had no NASH, had not much of expression of this protein. And suddenly, if you compare, the people with NASH had a lot of these proteins. So this may only show association. She decided to actually show causality. So to do that, she injected the mice with this enzyme, this protein kinase, and express them in the liver by a specific virus, both kinase defective and normal white type of this protein, and then put the mice on chow diet so that the high fat diet doesn't interfere with this. Chow diet didn't change any much in the wild type mouse. There is no fat here, but the expression of this protein actually increased the uh, fat in the liver, both kinase defective and normal one. Not only that, actually, plasma triglyceride went up, fat, you know, liver uh, triglyceride went up, but these uh, mice were insulin resistant. If you inject the insulin into the peritoneum, their glucose is much higher than the wild type mouse. So how comes that, you know, you have more fat in the liver, but you are insulin resistant? So that actually was a very good place to discover how can two different traits being associated together. By the way, I have to say that all the traits that I mentioned in these families post-segregated perfectly with the mutation. So there is a metabolic syndrome here we show. Now, let me give you a little bit of background how this can happen before I get to the result. When you actually are in feeding state, right, you actually have an insulin secreted, it comes and metabolizes glucose in TCA cycle, but also insulin wants to store some of it for later because you know, imagine you're a hunter-gatherer, you cannot always hunt. So you actually have to make some of it to glycogen for later, and also use some acetyl-CoA, which is the building block of the fatty acids, is also made from the glucose. Also, insulin prevents lipolysis in the peripheral tissue, it wants to store it. This triglyceride that is made in the liver or come to the liver and made in the liver again, is actually secreted in a form of VLDL. And then 
insulin stimulates an enzyme called lipoprotein lipase to break them down and fatty acid gets absorbed and everything is good. Now, when you're starving, well, brain needs glucose, brain needs ketone. You break down your glucose. First, the glycogen is break, broken down. Then you have not much insulin. Therefore, adipose tissue is broken down. And your fatty acids come to the liver. Actually, it contributes to the 50% of what the I mean, kind of a triglyceride that made in the liver. Also, some of your amino acids from the you know, muscle, if you have a patient in the ICU, you don't feed them, they, they lose their muscle, and they make it to the glucose by kind of uh, gluconeogenesis. This is uh, something actually important, as I mentioned, and you have not much of insulin here, but diabetes is actually something peculiar. When you have diabetes, well, you, you are insulin resistant, so insulin doesn't work, so you make glucose. That's what your fasting glucose goes up in your patient. When they get up, they haven't eaten anything, but the glucose goes up because it's, uh, you know, they make the acetyl-CoA, insulin is not there to inhibit it. But peculiarly, actually, they also make de novo lipogenesis. They make new lipids from building blood, from acetyl-CoA, not from the fatty acid only that comes to the liver, but from the de novo. So as I said, you know, if you're, uh, you have insulin resistance, you also break down some of your lipid from the peripheral lipids, uh, adipose tissue. So these both kind of contribute to the generation of triglycerides in your liver. But which one is contributing in our patients here? It is important because the dilemma you guys are having is that if it is this one, lipolysis, insulin, we're going to be insulin responsive. You give insulin, you shut down the lipolysis. If this is the one that causes triglyceride in your patient coming up, you're giving insulin, you're making more. And that's what the problem is. And some patients actually have both defects and they have a hard time to actually regulate their triglyceride. So to do that, we actually go back and we label the acetyl-CoA. I'm gonna go only briefly because of the sake of the time. But as I said, the glucose here comes to TCA cycle, lives as a citrate, and then makes this acetyl-CoA as a building block and then through enzymatic activity makes, two fatty, makes fatty acid, which adjoins actually fatty acid that you're taking up to your liver from lipolysis. Now we feed the mice with heavy water, which has deuterium. You're gonna labor your acetyl-CoA and this acetyl-CoA goes on to become a long chain fatty acid. It joins the fatty acid that is coming from periphery, but the fatty acid coming from periphery is not labeled anymore. So you can, if you do a mass spec, you can distinguish the two, labeled versus unlabeled, from the liver versus not from the liver. And what she found out is that if you have it therefore be in your liver, this mice is gonna actually make labeled fatty acid, it means they're synthesizing fatty acid in the liver. And if they have kinase defect, it's the same thing. And if you look at the secretion of triglyceride over time, the mice have to have therefore be in the liver, have more secretion of triglyceride. If you knock it down, the triglyceride release is gonna go down. So interesting, but yet these mice are insulin resistant. So what's happening? Well, we did the uh, proteomics analysis. We could, uh, took the mice wild type and those who actually have higher Derfon B in the liver. And we took also wild type and those who actually have knockout of the Derfon B in the liver. The pathway analysis, lipid pathway here in green came as most significant. And one of the factors actually that has come as an upstream factor through this analysis was a protein called Richter, which was knocked out or was reduced if you have a knockout mouse, means that their B is a stimulating a Richter. What is Richter? Well, let me tell you that the way the insulin causes lipogenesis is by activating two protein complexes called mTORs, mTOR C2, mTOR C1. I'm not gonna to go to do the detail what exactly they do in AKT phosphorylation, but they knew, need, they need these two complexes. And these complexes have a lot of proteins, some of them inhibitors, some of them activators. One of the proteins here is the Rixor for mTOR C2. And this one came out through this analysis to be regulated by dec one b How? Well, first of all, my postdoc actually decided to look at this Rixor mouse, to look at those mice that have no Rixor. This is actually uh, oil red oil staining of the liver, suggesting fat in the liver. And as you see, this is a wild type mouse on a high fat diet. This is a mouse which has actually Derk 1B, the gene we discovered, excessively in the liver and has much more fat. 
The mice that actually have knocked out of Richter, this component of mTORC2, have reduced fat. And even if you inject them with the LERP one b if you overexpress the R gene in their liver, they don't make fat, which means that R gene is upstream from mTORC2. So how does it happen, though? Well, it happens that despite the fact that LERP one b inhibits insulin receptor, it moves through insulin to the complex and takes out its inhibitor, deptor here, and phosphorylase mTORC2 and induces lipogenesis. So it bypasses insulin receptor. That is how these two these traits are linked. So briefly again, there can be inhibits insulin receptor through a complex pathway that I don't have time to get into, causes glucose production. That's why your patient with diabetes have glucose in the morning. It also activates mTOR C2, phosphorylase mTOR, and causes lipogenesis. Therefore, it's a great target. Why? Because if you inhibit the DEC1B, you're going to reduce the glucose production, you're going to reduce the lipogenesis. You cannot do it with mTOR inhibition or anything else because then they will have glucose elevation. So then uh, what uh, she did, she went and knocked down uh, DEC1B in the liver and put them on a high fat diet. As you see, this is a wild type mouse. This is a uh, a mouse that actually have no DERF1 being delivered, and there was not much of a fat in the liver. Not only that, also um, the triglyceride went up, down. I don't know why this is moving. Wrong direction, anyways. Okay, sorry. And actually, the glucose, when you did the insulin tolerance test, the glucose went down. So actually, this is a target to reduce the glucose, to reduce the liver. And actually, industry is now working on. CRISPR of it, and siRNA to, to target this gene to treat the fatty liver disease. Mostly it focuses like it did because the effect on glucose is very small. Now it comes to the family of this woman that I actually introduced to you at the beginning of the case, and she is here with an arrow. There were much, much, many more people in actually had the disease and all had the uh, traits of the metabolic syndrome from diabetes to hypertension to hypertriglyceridemia. They were also very hyperinsulinemic, very, very hyperinsulinemic. And we found other family, uh, kindreds as well who actually had a mutation in a pancreatic exocrine enzyme. This is an enzyme you secrete in your gut to digest your uh, you know, uh, protein, it's a protease. And this gene was kind of surprising to us that how can this cause? And this is also an elastase and breaks down some, some, some of the uh, elastins. So the mutation in this family was very peculiar and told us that this mutation, even though it's a resistance mutation, is a loss of function mutation. Why? Let me take you to the structure of this protein. As I said to you, this is a, a protease, is a serine protease, which means that serine attacks the peptide bond. I want to show a small part of a peptide. It breaks down peptide bond. So to attack it has to actually free itself from the hydrogen and hydroxyl group so that oxygen is actually more nucleophilic, attacks the bond. To do that has to lose its hydrogen to a histidine, which is far away on the lineal uh, kind of a protein, but it's actually in 3D, is very close to it. And then when it, histidine takes it into its own cloud, has to be stabilized by another amino acid called aspartic acid. And this aspartic acid in a neutral pH is actually a conjugate base. So it has given its hydrogen away. Now he wants another hydrogen, takes the hydrogen from histidine, and stabilizes this structure, and then serine can attack the peptide bond, breaks the peptide. Now the mutation in our family actually made aspartic acid to asparagine. No more acid, doesn't lose hydrogen, doesn't want hydrogen. Therefore, serine cannot attack the, actually the peptide bond. And if you look at these, when we actually generated this construct and in, in vitro, in hex cells, we found out actually they have lost, all of these mutations have lost their enzymatic activity. Now, we were questioning, is it a microbiomes? And it may be even uh, if this enzyme is secreted into the gut, but it can be also this enzyme is somewhere else that people didn't know. And we did a, you know, here is in my histochemistry, this is control. And as you see, is the exocrine pancreas, as people have shown before, is highly expressed, but also in the adrenal gland, in the intestinal gland, 
And in a pyre plaque, which is actually immune system of the gut, they are highly expressed. It's also circulating. And it's very interesting because when we do mixed meal uh, test, which is, you know, you give a mixture of meals to people, and you take patients who actually have pancreatectomy for pancreatitis, they go undergo uh, implantation of the uh, islet cells into the liver, but we can measure these enzymes before they have pancreas removed and after, and we give them meal each, each time. You can see the secretion of this enzyme here in blue before pancreatectomy goes up. After pancreatectomy is obviously reduced because it's secreted from the pancreas apparently into the blood. And interestingly, very much in parallel to C peptide. So it means that actually it's highly uh, it, it kind of secreted from the pancreas into the blood, but also not only from pancreas. So there are other sources that we are working on. Now, it is actually quite interesting to look at this problem because imagine you guys have been looking at your patients with pancreatitis. You said amylase lipase is going up to your blood, of your, you know, and because it's elevated, right? And then if somebody has normal levels of amyloid lipase, you never make a second thought of it. Why did this digestive enzyme that's supposed to go to gut suddenly appear in the blood? Are they having any role? And that was actually a medical student that brought this to my attention when I gave him a lecture. And, it's, and I, my thought was that, oh my God, maybe they are not active and they have to become active in the blood. Maybe lipase has no role in the blood. It just gets into the blood. How is it getting into the blood, first of all? And actually it happens that are active and amylases are active. And now imagine you have on the surface of your cells glycoproteins and amylase is there. Is it going to have no effect? We actually believe that variation in the level of these can give you a small effect on your signaling pathway, blood lipid, et cetera. Something for actually a lot of epidemiologists to work on. Now, um, we actually measured the uh, level of this enzyme in our patients. Interestingly, they were increased. If you look at this, there were increased levels of this enzyme, pancreatic enzyme, but this function was actually lower, so they had lower elastic activity. Then we took actually volunteers from the lab. Many of the you know, guys sitting here, your lab members actually participated in the study. We feed them, we measured before feeding and after feeding the solid way. Interestingly, it went up after the feeding, and also obviously insulin went up, C peptide went up. This is obvious, you, you know that. But what was strange was a perfect correlation. Means that this individual who had the highest levels of cell A has also highest level of insulin secretion. Perfect correlation. Now, chicken or egg, which one is causing what? Insulin causing this secretion or this is causing insulin secretion? So, uh, by the way, I forgot to say that actually we did also samples from hyperglycemic clamp, patient who give, given glucose and their insulin is measured. We see parallel insulin levels and cell A Oral glucose tolerance test, same thing. So it's not an incretin because when you inject, also goes up. Incretin means that if you only in response to oral food, your enzyme goes up. So it's not an incretin, unfortunately. I would love it to be an incretin. But to know which one is causing what, we actually got the LDL receptor knockout mouse. These mice, by the way, are insulin resistant. They have actually diabetic. The glucose levels are high because of LDLs. And when we actually injected these mice with the cell A2A, obviously very high dose, so that mice actually almost dying here from hyperglycemia, so it dropped their glucose. And in parallel, the C-peptide went up, so meaning that they're actually inducing insulin secretion. Let me also explain that this is a recombinant cell A2A made in the bacteria. Cell A2A made in every cell doesn't do that. It depends on which cell, and we are studying it, that what cells are actually causing this in the body. But to know if it is a direct effect, we got the islets of rats, extra corporal, and um, with our collaboration in the endocrinology, and then it stimulated them with the low glucose, high glucose, and bang, actually with high glucose, the, the insulin secretion went up. So it induces insulin secretion, and the good thing is that only when the glucose is up. So if you actually in, um, you get a normal mice, you don't get that effect. Strangely, but not maybe strangely, because most of the elastases break down insulin, it also breaks down insulin, something that we only saw in the wild type, and maybe a sm slightly here, but the mutant protein doesn't break down insulin. And if you actually use, take the tissue, which is cell lines, tissues, anything, all cell lines actually, and you stimulate them with this enzyme without insulin, 
and look at the insulin signaling pathway, AKT, mTOR, whatnot. The wild time actually does the same thing as insulin. So it actually makes the insulin sense, the tissue insulin sensitive and actually activates the canonical insulin signaling. But the mutants don't, don't do, which is, um, I apologize for being so small. Now, it is much more complex, and another postdoc in my lab is working on that, which of these actually really happening, and where is this happening, is actually the topic of our studies right now. But what this study showed us is the second conundrum, and that is, you have patients who are insulin resistant. How comes they develop then beta cell dysfunction? Insulin resistant in the tissue, beta dysfunction in the pancreas, this actually linked the two because this is a protein that causes insulin secretion, it's a protein called insulin sensitivity, and that kind of combines this pre-diabetic diabetic stage. Now, uh, the, uh, the interesting thing is that many times, actually, when I send a grant, the investigator, I mean, the reviewers are gonna say, well, you found this mutation in these people, they're, they're not affecting everybody, which I always respond that, you know what, LDL receptor homozygote that Brown and Goldstein found in only one you know, kid, eight year old. Now the drug is used widely. And you know, this gives you some pathway. And they, they don't listen. You know, it doesn't help. So that's why we actually go and say, okay, can I link it to HALS or GMOS? We have to do this. You, know, we have, you have to get the grant. So you have to do what they want you to do. And it's interesting, actually, that common variants in this gene is widely associated with hypertension in many nations, even in Africa that we looked at. It's actually interesting, some of these variants change the expression level of this gene, SOLA2A, in the adrenal gland. You may say, what adrenal gland? Well, adrenal gland had aldosterone, you know that. But actually, right now we are learning that adrenal gland also has renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, all of them. So RAS system in the adrenal gland. It's actually published, you can go to the literature. And it obviously the reduced levels is associated with hypertension. Not only that, if you go to databases, it's also associated with the BMI and LDL cholesterol. So the common variant suddenly is associated with multiple traits, even though it is not normally the case. So uh, this brings me to the role of common variants or GWAS variants in identifying uh, metabolic traits and how they are linked. So you guys know GVOS is kind of very simple. You take uh, cases, you take controls, and you look at millions of SNPs to see which one is more common in case versus control. Now, remember, you have three billions of nucleotides. You're only testing one million of that. You should be terribly lucky that that variant they're looking is actually causal. You may find that variant that is more in cases versus control, but doesn't say it is causal. It could be actually linked on a seg be sitting on the same segment that the real mutation is there. Now we do a Manhattan plot. We see which one variants in what chromosome is increased here is in chromosome six and X chromosome. But one thing I want to say that is that these variants have a small effect. Why? Because it's, you have to have a statistic significance to get a statistic significance. You look at variants that at least is present more than one percent of the population. Actually. Well, preferably more than 10%. Sometimes it's actually 50%. So how can that be actually having a large effect when 50% of control have it? So it's not going to be large effect. Second thing I want you guys to learn, especially my colleagues in basic science, is that when you see their sleep on your gene, doesn't mean you're affecting your gene. That can have a remote effect. And that you have to always have this caveat. And you have to do a lot of work with that. So because the small is, the effect is small, People have to, to make this polygenic risk scoring, put multiple of them. And actually, people like Kara have shown that, yes, you can, if you have a lot of SNPs, say that it's um, kind of abnormal SNPs or associated with coronary disease, you can actually identify patients at risk. But you can use that, for example, in your patient who is not taking the static to say, well, you have a high risk. Can you use it for segregation, meaning that to see who is affected in their family? No. And I tell you why, because this SNPs, let's say this individual is affected, the father is affected, is getting his SNPs not only from the father, but some of them from the mother. And he's not gonna pass them all to his children because it's gonna be half of his genome gonna go to his children. So we cannot use that to know 
who is at risk of this, you know, relative of this patient, but we can use that to convince this individual, you are at high risk. If you don't take your statin, you're gonna be in trouble. Now, GFS SNPs are mainly associated with a single metabolic trait, not all the metabolic traits, as an exception. And most studied uh, SNPs are actually hot blood pressure SNPs, which I actually I pur purposefully took it here because Berliner actually was the one who actually was the uh, kind of studying salt effects, and especially salt in the kidney. And I'm actually honored to uh, have his endowment uh, 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 under his name. So I took actually one of our studies that actually we look at the blood pressure and how blood pressure SNPs can be uh, causing disease. A lot of thousands, a thousand actually regions have been identified. Hypertension is the largest uh, kind of risk factor for coronary artery disease. But you know, in these thousand low side doesn't mean that they know what gene is causing it. It's just sitting on that gene, but it can have a remote effect. Like here affecting this gene, here is a stem affecting this gene. So we became interested in a locus on chromosome five. It's called PRDM6 locus, which is you know, locus where this gene is. Not only because also it's causing hypertension, but interestingly, this is still associated with multiple metabolic traits. And uh, if you look at the database, it's actually associated with HDL cholesterol, BMI, brain and thoracic aneurysm. So we were excited about it. And some of you guys actually are familiar with the Mendelian randomization may think, okay, maybe this is SNP is causing high blood pressure and through high blood pressure aneurysm. So, but I have to say it's not the case. Actually, just briefly for your understanding, if this is your gene, this, uh, mutations that affect the human, you discover in GVAS, often they are not within the coding region. They are in you know, proximal, distal, different places, intronic, intergenic, but they are often enhancers, means that on this region, a transcription factor sits, and then DNA bends itself, goes to the promoter, and does a transcription. But they have actually enhancers in many different regions, upstream, downstream, on the gene, and each of them actually function independently in a different context. Some of them, as you guys know, have to be opened by histone modification. They are DNA wrapped around the histone. It's not available for transcription factor. You have to unbind it by histone modification. Some of them actually become functional in aorta, causing aortic aneurysm for this case. Some of them in the kidney, causing hypertension. So it, they are not related, but isn't actually activating the same gene but in different contexts. So you're expressing this PRDM6 lower in the one context causes aneurysm, in another context causes HDL, in another context causes uh, hypertension. We were interested in this because it's actually a histone modifier. It has a set domain, this is a set domain. What does set domain do? Well, set domain modifies histones. Why, what is histone? Well, histone is where all these DNAs are wrapped around. Unavailable for transcription factor, you have to unbind them. And the way to do it, you actually modify the tail of this histone by methylation, acetylation, et cetera. And this protein does that. I don't gonna go into detail exactly how does it, but also we were excited about this end gene because highly expressed in the vasculature, in all the vasculature. And uh, therefore it was a great candidate. So well, let's say, you know, we said, first of all, our task is to prove that these SNPs in this region are really affecting the PRDM6, nothing else. And second, get a mouse, show that this PRDM6 has a change in your blood, uh, blood pressure. So there were four SNPs actually shown here in the intron three of this gene. And interestingly, what I'm showing in the table is that if you look at them, these SNPs change the expression levels of this protein in the aorta and tibial artery means that this is SNPs affect the level of this protein, PRDM6, which is a histone modifier. So we took the whole segment of here out, PRDM6 went down. So that's proved that this region is actually important for expression of your gene. Then we said, well, you know what, who knows these SNPs are doing it or the neighboring SNPs are doing it. We took actually 330 SNPs in that region with many, many, many permutations. We build a construct, put it in the cell, said, okay, which of these SNPs is affecting expression of my gene? Just briefly. We found only a few, which shown in the red here. And interestingly, one of them here shown by number 
is exactly the same lead SNP discovered by GWAS. So they were lucky that GWAS SNP actually was causal SNP, meaning it affected the expression. And then we maybe knocked out the, this portal, only this 52 base pair, we actually reduced the expression levels. It's interesting actually that this, we, we, we look at the method, we call it chip seek, was a binding site for a transcription mm -hmm. factor called the STAT1. When we actually stimulate these, uh, you know, uh, 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 muscle cells by interferon gamma, that activates the STAT1, the level of our gene goes up, you knock it out, you take it out, the level goes down. So it's a proof that actually STAT1 is the upstream transcription factor is important because STAT1 itself is a locus for hypertension. And then uh, we took all these SNPs here one by one, showing that all of them actually regulate expression, which what, that, what does that mean? It means that this region has a poly enhancer. What is a poly enhancer? Let me just make you familiar with it means that these regions, each of them binding one transcription factor or the other, they all group each other. Your DNA bends here by the bending protein, goes on the promoter, and then activate transcription. And all these play some role. So we said, okay, let's go to the mouse. And unfortunately, the mice, uh, when we knock it out uh, in the sumus cells, they die from what we call a patent ductus arteriosus. People are proud of it because we had already shown in human that mutation in this gene, PRDM6, causes patent ductus arteriosus. So showing it in an animal, proof of pudding, okay? Uh, but how can you then study these animals? So um, we just decided actually to knock out this gene in adult mouse. Now it's called target knockout. And put them on a salt diet, no effect, desperate. But my postdoc was actually quite persevere, push on, and he said, you know what? This gene seems to do some congenital defects. Maybe this hypertension is congenital disease. So he said, you know what? I'm gonna take the heterozygote mouse that they, don't, they survive, they don't die. The mouse that dies and have PDA are homozygote. They have two allele missing. So he did that and lo and behold, hypertension was there on the salt. And he was very proud. I was proud of him. And he then said, you know what, how does it happen? Because this gene I told you is expressed highly in the vasculature, he took the uh, iota of this mice and did actually uh, RNA-seq analysis. You see this, you know, these are cases uh, and these are, uh, these are uh, control mice on top, uh, cases on the bottom and upregulated genes are already in red, downregulated in blue. And about 1000 genes were changed when you remove these PRDM6 from the assumed muscle cells, thousand. But 40, 40 of them were actually genes in the GWAS loci for hypertension, telling you that this gene actually master regulated by all other genes that regulate blood pressure, which was cool. And then we did the pathway analysis, et cetera. And this pathway analysis told us that actually what has changed is a renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So just briefly, renin is made in the kidney, cleaves actually angiotensinogen in the blood, and then goes undergoes this activation of the uh, aldosterone, and you absorb sodium through the uh, epithelial sodium channels. And when Kushan looked at uh, that, you know, in these mice, obviously PRDM6 was low, but then renin was high. And also aldosterone was high, which we don't know yet why, but we focused on the renin. And at the protein levels, these mice had the higher renin levels. So from the work of others, we knew that renin actually, uh, during uh, early embryogenesis in the metanephric kidney is everywhere around the vasculature of the kidney, all over the vasculature of the kidney. Here, renin is shown in green, and a cell in red, and they are all over. But then retracts itself. What happens? These cells become a sumus cell, differentiated. They don't make any renin. They just go in the juxtaglomerular region where the macula densa is to sense the salt in your tubules, right? Uh, distal tubules. So it limits itself. And then when Kushan looked at the mouse that had no PRDM6, whether homozygote, which, you know, even though they die during embryogenesis, you can look at the kidney and the renin is shown in green here. The renin levels were high, actually not the renin level only, 
but also cells, there were so many cells that had renin in the kidney. Now, there, when you look at the amount of renin in each cell, there was no difference. When you look at the number of renin producing cells, they were increased. And what we learned from this, which I'm not gonna to go too much in detail after that, is that TRDM6 regulates differentiation of sumas cells. If it's not there, you're gonna have renin cells all over your kidneys. And that's why these mice had high blood pressure. And this actually explained to us a pathway that how blood pressure with one SNP can uh, happen. To prove that actually, uh, the, we did a lot of transgenic mice, but they asked us to actually give a renin inhibitor to these mice and say, okay, inhibit it and get rid of blood pressure. As you guys know, when you have hypertension, normally your renin is not high. Normally downstream is high, angiotensin two. Actually you suppress your renin. Therefore, even if you put your normal mouse on high salt, they're not gonna have hypertension. Our mice had hypertension, and when we give them aliskirin, they actually normalize their blood pressure. The renin inhibitor normalized, suggesting that yes, renin is causing all these. Why is that important? It's actually precision medicine. Because you're not using aliskirin in our patients, but maybe some of them respond to it. Maybe some of them have this SNP, and this SNP maybe has some effect, or maybe not, but they have to find out. And the treatment varies here. So briefly here, this is a small cell and it's that one upstream transcription factor regulates our gene PRDM6, which then regulates the, how much cells that are renin producing are available, then activates angiotensin, renin angiotensin aldosterone. And in these people with a sleep, probably this a small amount of increase in renin contributes to the blood pressure. Now, to tell you that actually one gene can do so many things, so don't be actually surprised that somebody tells you this gene caused this disease, but the same gene caused another disease. Because as I told you that, there are several regulations that are kind of independent regulation of your gene happens in different contexts, different tissues. One of the actually studies that actually uh, Amit uh, actually knows that, and the, the, uh, uh, our, our colleague Kara knows that also, is that when you look at the images, uh, uh, MRI images in UK Biobank, and you look at the ascending aorta, you can identify a SNPs that actually affect the diameter of the ascending aorta. And one of the genes associated actually the same thing is our PRDM6. And although the effects, you know, the SNP, the p-value here is a little less than some of the other ones, the effect size is the greatest. So if you get a z-score, Z has the highest z-score for aneurysm, this PRDM6 that causes, you know, it be linked, it linked to the hypertension. So we actually did some analysis with our colleagues. We identified the SNP that can regulate it. That is SNP actually shown in this line here is actually binding site for SMAT2. And SMAT2, you guys know, is downstream from TGF signaling. And my uh, kind of talented postdoc went on and actually uh, used the inhibition, inhibitor of the TGF signaling and the expression level of the T, uh, our gene PRDM6 went down, meaning it's downstream uh, from the SMAT2 uh, as a transcription factor. Why does it matter? Because many of you have actually have used the uh, TGF inhibition in your patients and no, no good effect, actually. We know that because the angiotensin inhibitors actually reduce the TGF signaling and you guys have been using the angiotensin inhibitors, and there's not much going on. And they say maybe that's because if you inhibit the TGF, you're reducing a gene that is important for keeping your order small, and that is PRDM6. And as an example. So proof is in the pudding. I decided not to show all the signaling pathway or no Western blood or nothing else, just to show this image, that if you have a PRDM6 knockout mouse, you can actually, under, under angiotensin, have such a big thoracoabdominal aneurysm. Now, why is it abdominal aneurysm also? In human, we said it's thoracic aneurysm. It's actually, we can go into the details, but there is some uh, migration of neural crest cells to the abdominal aneurysm that can explain that. So I'm glad I'm actually finishing it on time. So in conclusion, the advent of modern human genetics tools has resulted in an advanced understanding of the genetic structure, the role of epigenetic regulation of gene expression, the diversity in human, and their link to physiology and disease. 
These tools have proven that genes can have diverse if function in context-dependent manner. Common and rare genetic uh, variants have different applications, such as risk stratification when you use common, and also cascade screening and drug development when you discover a rare variant. Much obstacle must uh, still are overcome because you find the locus, you don't really need to know what is the gene. You see how much work we did to uh, prove that this is a PRDM6, but a lot of work is needed to be done. I'm talking to my fellows here, cardiovascular fellows. There's a lot to be done, and you guys can join our lab if you're interested to actually help us discover these. And despite all this obstacle, human uh, genetics remains one of the most potent tools to understand the pathogenic of human disease. Obviously, this work could not have been done by me alone. Actually, I'm kind of just an innocent bystander. Uh, my fellows did it actually here uh, in this group, but also collaboration with a lot of sections, people at CBRC. Actually, Dan Graf is here. I think we got a mouse from him, uh, the reporter mouse. I don't know, I, I didn't explain it here, but, uh, and uh, funding agencies. And thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Thank you. Yes. In seeing those pictures, I started thinking of corticosteroids, secondary to liver disease. But is there something intrinsic to the visceral adipocytes that could be sort of a part of this trunkal obesity? Right. So it is actually, John, if it, not, nobody heard it on the, online, as asking, is there anything about visceral obesity? In fact, actually, yes, it is uh, actually different if you have obesity in your buttock versus you have in the abdomen. You guys know the disease called lipodystrophy. The lipodystrophy is generally associated with the low leptin levels. These people get diabetes and women get coronary artery disease, not men, interestingly. And these patients have very low fat in their muscle, the arm and buttock. Uh, we had had some of them in the clinic actually was not diagnosed on, on, on like medical service. So you probably have to pay attention more carefully when you do exam. And if, when you put the fat in the buttock, the problem resolves. Actually, uh, Jerry Schulman did it. And it tells you that the fat in the buttock, for example, is much better than the fat in the, uh, the blank. <laughs> uh, but how exactly, it seems to be actually, there are hormonal uh, variations between if you take the, the fat from here, from here, they are different. It's not a brown or white, but it's different the secretion of the adipokines. kinds. targets that, you know, um, your work is, is uh, kind of uh, providing industry to, to pursue. Um, you know, it, it strikes me that a place like Yale is, is very special for many reasons, but it is really a, a place that we're, we're just kind of working really be facilitated. And, and in terms of not only having uh, access to a lot of patient interests, uh, but also ability to affect across schools and laboratories to kind of focus on the data. So in your, in your 20 plus years here, yeah. <laughs> Don't say uh, it no more. <laughs> if you had, had a magic wand and you could um, facilitate, uh, what, you know, what would, um, how, how would you empower this kind of, uh, of work or successful? How can you connect all these vitals patient care, investigative work, biobanking, statistical analysis? Right. I mean, I think there is some effort on the way uh, by the dean, uh, and that is actually have a center for precision medicine. I think this center has to kind of assimilate all these organizations that you mentioned, and one director who has a vision to understand that not only this is important, but also that component is important, that component is important, not to be only you know, looking at the basic science to this side, but also have insight into the clinical medicine, knowing what the problems are, getting input from all of them. 
that is very much matters. I mean, that is very important. Now, I, I'm actually fortunate that I'm also a clinician. And uh, not that, you know, I value a lot my uh, colleagues uh, sitting here who have more insight in medicine than I do. But uh, that, at least for, to me, gave me some insight to know where the problem is, what to look, you know, where is the kind of, um, uh, this kind of paradox. For example, paradox of this TG being secreted while you're insulin resistant, paradox of having insulin resistant while you also later you have a pan pancreatic problem. These are all the things, but you need to have an organization, a leadership who understands the whole problem, has some experience in all of these areas, maybe, you know, and then assimilate all these groups. I think that's the best way to do it. Yale is the greatest, is actually such a collaborative environment. I mean, we go to anyone here, they work with us and we do the same to them. Um, and it's the best place to do this. I hope I answered your question, but yeah. Oh yeah, that was amazing. I mean, it's amazing how prolific you've been and great, so interesting. Um, I just had a very granular question compared to Eric's question, very kind of focused. So in your Dirk 1B, uh, human uh, mutants that you found, if I'm not mistaken, that was outside of the kinase yes, domain. Yeah. Uh, um, have you, one, made a mouse or, or done an overexpression with that human uh, mutation in the mouse? Because Yes, that... yes, yes. We have actually the exact same mutation of the larger family. So I didn't mention those families were from here, but we also had the second mutation, H90P, which we discovered here in the U.S. population. You know, several families. We made the one in from Iran because it was the oldest one. Uh, they actually have, seems to have, it's very complicated enzyme, by the way. If you overexpress in the liver, uh, you uh, cause insulin resistance uh, and, you know, uh, uh, fatty liver. If you completely knock it out, actually insulin secretion goes down. So we were quite kind of thinking which one is happening. And it seems that actually is uh, this mutation uh, in the individuals actually cause, uh, is a neomorph, means that neither complete loss nor complete gain. Then is, when we generated this mutation, thus far it shows that they have a low insulin secretion in the mouse. Now, the caveat is that many times mouse model does not exactly replicate the human disease. In fact, actually we, uh, yeah, the exact, the second family I showed, we took their macrophages, which also express the cell 2 a and we see completely different things than in mouse. So, but yeah, I mean, the mutation was we have generated and they have a low insulin secretion. We're gonna publish it, we haven't published it yet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Go 